Now, one quick note. There were studies done back in 2008 and 2009 on the state of African Americans. One of the things that they found that was absolutely disturbing are the trends among African American males who graduate high school, who, but who don't attend college. But they put it making less money per hour than their fathers. Unheard of. 82%. They found that 50% by the time age 30 were in jail. 50%. These are high school graduates. No high, no. Now, I, I can go on, but let me stop to say this. College is not optional. If they don't go to college, too many of the jobs that they used to be able to get are overseas. So now, a post-secondary education is more critical than in the past years. And it's no longer optional for us to say, well, we don't believe college is for everybody. It's not really an option. They have the choice, 82% making less money than their dad, 50% going to jail, or going to school. Which option are we going to prepare them for? So let's have some reactions to this. Uh, we, we're not going to tear you too long, but about, for about five minutes, we're going to have some dialogue. And try to keep your comments um, brief so that other people can um, participate as well. I don't need the mic. Oh. Oh. <laughs> the whole purpose of this was to address the difference education makes. And I feel like we were amused at how some of us were uh, ingenious of coming about things. But for me, it's, it just show it's too many of us having to do that. And I think that's the main purpose of that is that, yes, we can do it, we can make it. However, do we want groups of people to have to continue to be stressed and be ingenious with how to live on? I mean, with $375 a week, you really can't meet basic needs. One of the limited things. So that's just my main comment. That's, that's the it, definition of poverty. Right, it's the working poor. And too many people in the groups of people of color are working poor. And so we do need to look at that, and that's the difference that education makes. So that's that was it. my comment about that. That 375, for example, is a person who works full time at minimum wage, and that family is living below the poverty line in America. The idea that poor people don't work and that's why they're poor, that's not true. That is just not true. Around 60% of poor, of poor people are full time employed individuals. But our minimum wage is such that it does not allow fully employed people to keep up with the financial requirements of society. Additional comments? I'm going to be brief. Um, I'm talking about my own experience. Um, I myself come from um, a long line of women that work on welfare. My grandmother, my mother, and the cycle in to continue, the support of my mom, to continue to go along with that, we call it generational curse. Mm -hmm. So when I actually stepped off of welfare, it was, the, it was right when the welfare to work program was started. Mm -hmm. And I refused to be kicked off, I walked off. And that's not um, something that happens a lot in my community. And still, having four children of my own, you know, married, all of my children are by the same man. That, um, another, that's something that also is rare in my community. Um, and still finding a, a place of employment that is nonprofit, and there's not even a lot of money in nonprofit. You know, getting the education. My husband has a bachelor's degree and still can't find a job. So that is my reality. Um, I don't, I make more than 375, but God knows it ain't that far. <laughs> you know? And it's a struggle. And there are people that I know in my family and in my community that makes less than 375 and that have children with no husband. So that's the reality also. And my, the thing about my, my mother, we never knew we were poor. Never knew we were poor. I didn't know I was, I was poverty in poverty until I started working and somebody told me, you know, that, that I met a certain guideline. Um, but we, I don't know what needs to be done, but I know there are some changes that needs to be 
made. And that's why I'm here to first to, so I can become educated and then educate those people that are in my community. We'll make one more comment. Great, great words. Can you heard? Hi. Actually, what I really thought of was from a parent perspective. I was thinking about the stress of what it was in terms of how can I get my kids here, how can I get transportation, how am I going to live, which even makes it even more important to have responsible teachers in our public schools to be able to take some of this burden off. Because parents don't even have the time to be thinking about, is the school the right place? They are trusting that the administrators, they're trusting that the teachers, they're trusting that everybody in the educational community has their child's best interest and that every student should have high expectations and they don't have time to be able to be thinking about fighting for what's right. Well, we'll have a question and answer period in a couple minutes. We want to move quickly and share with you some of the final points of the Drew Tate curriculum. Um, because one of the key missing variables um, and closing the achievement gap is a very strategic and organized way of empowering parents to lead the educational processes of their children it is the key missing variable. We have every policy you can imagine, every curriculum you can imagine, every way of teaching you can imagine. What's missing? is empowered parents. I challenge anybody to find a, a social group in America who parents are not in control of the education of their children and that community is doing well. I look, can't find it. I'm still looking. Hopefully I can find somebody. Let's look very quickly here. This gives us you said, well, why did you come to that conclusion? Well, I went back and studied since the country started. That was important to do. Uh, and within that context, particularly within the context of black education, what we find is that over the course of time, education has gradually shifted. Well, let's start from the beginning. Slavery is reported to have started in the, in the, in the Americas in 1611 according to some accounts, so I'm putting it early, much earlier. If we take 1611 up to 1776, which is the founding of American society, that is six generations of Africans in slavery. But you all know slavery didn't end in 1776, right? It ended in 1865. So you take 1776, through 1865, that is an additional three generations of African Americans in slavery. Nine total. What does that have to do with this equation? During the slave era, they were forbidden to read or write. It was punishable in Alabama by 50 lashes to first offense and 100 on bareback to second offense. Then they deported them from the state because they didn't want it to become contagious. We, as we ended slavery, we found that around 90% of African Americans in that 1865 generation were illiterate. Couldn't read or write, around 90%, 10% were illiterate. You had uh, missionaries who came from the North who felt that in order for you to decide if you're gonna become a Christian, you have to know how to read the text. You, know how to, you have to know how to read the scriptures. So they, they educated. So that's where you get that 10% from. So 90% were illiterate, 10% were literate. The amazing thing is what happens when education became available to African Americans from 1866 to 1896. That's one generation. And one generation, and it was primarily done by northern philanthropists, educators coming from the north, as well as education done through the African American community and organizations, primarily the church in the black community. What they did educationally in this one generation out of slavery was amazing. Within one lifetime, 90% of African Americans became literate, only 10% were illiterate. Now, I hear you say, well, Dr. Jane, tell me more. Give us more. Myth number one, we can't educate poor children in America. Uh, they did it back then. 
with less technology, no internet, no manipulatives and all that stuff that we use now, they did it then. Could own property in slavery. Y'all remember that, right? These people were poor. They were poor. They were poor. <laughs> Myth number two, we can't educate kids whose parents are not well educated themselves. They didn't hear it. Only 35% of, of those freed slaves ever became literate in their lifetime. The parents were undereducated, but yet the children were educated within one lifetime. The question that's to be asked, what in the world did they do to do this? How did they pull that off? I'm not going to give you the answer yet. 1896 and 1954, two more generations. Those were gen generations known as the Jim Crow era, separate and unequal. Not separate enough and equal, but separate and unequal. These two generations also experienced a tremendous amount of academic, social, and emotional success in schools. Tremendous amount. They closed all sorts of achievement gaps. Think about it. African American kids did not go to elementary schools because there weren't any for them. Segregation. First, you had to have you had a facilities gap. Northern philanthropists in black communities raised the money to build an entire separate private elementary school system for African American children. First gap closed, the elementary facility gap. Second gap, elementary attendance gap. They had to get the kids to the school, close that. Middle school had to build facilities, get kids in. Two more gaps closed. We go on and on. These are a number of gaps that were closed during these eras following slavery. Our challenge is after desegregation, much of that knowledge about how they did it was lost. Much of it was lost. Part of the reason why is because at universities, they forbade black professors from researching black America. Right around the time when we started to desegregate, it became known as black on black research. You couldn't do it. Although other people was doing white on white research, black on black research was seen as too biased. The problem was all of this great pedagogy and teaching and leadership and practice was lost. And trust me, they headed down to a science. We have now discovered that these black educators, along with white assistants from the North, had a national curriculum and a national professional development network that was aligned across the nation every year to, to meet strategic needs of children and aligned within every state, in every school, in every community. They did it without the internet, without cell phones. Our problem is, because all this information was lost, because all this information was lost, it leads us to the two generations that we have now in America. Really the 2.1, young children like mine, that's that point one generation. My mother was in that desegregation generation. She tells me the story of how they were desegregated. Many people in my generation, known as the hip hop generation, was truly the first group of people in America educated in truly desegregated settings, but actually the schools never desegregated. The workforce desegregated, but the school populations never desegregated. But this is where the achievement gap lies. Generation seven, eight, and nine. It is not a persistent phenomenon. It is actually fairly recent which means that it's solvable. But what we have to do is to learn from history and not be limited by it. Too many people, when they look back at history, they become limited by what they find in the past because of the pain and the failures. But I'm advocating that we should look forward and understand and learn from our history so it can inform our potential and our progress. So what they did was it, 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 these lessons that we learned from these black educators and the, the systems that put it, that Northern philanthropists helped put in place are born into, fed into the 3K curriculum. Primarily designed to help empower 
teachers through social justice education. What is that? You're going through it right now. First phase, becoming more aware, social consciousness, becoming aware of the challenges that we're dealing with. Second phase, moral courage. Can you act? Can you act despite opposition? Can you, just, can you act when it's unpopular? Do you have moral courage as a leader, as a teacher, as a parent? Third phase, effective practice. Can you bring about equity in your sphere of influence? We have a system to train teachers, train schools on how to do that. Our curriculum for parents are designed to give parents the ability to promote habits throughout the lifetime of their child from kindergarten, from birth, through graduation to college. Those are the blue, the blue texts you see underneath. You see, in the first and second grade, parents really should focus on developing some critical habits to academic success. It doesn't matter at that age if the kids don't like to study. It's not optional. It doesn't matter if they don't want to correct math problems when you correct it. It's not optional. So there's some habits that have to be developed. Early on, it's important that parents balance play-based learning, environmental-based learning, and structured learning, right? Because kids learn from the environment, they learn through play, they learn through structure. If you just them, simply let them learn through play, when the structure of school comes along, they're not prepared to deal with that structure. And so forth and so on. So these are the major targets, the social, emotional, academic targets that we hope to infuse and equip parents with the ability to do. Not just as an individual parent, but in concert with other parents, community organizations, and schools. But let's get more specific. How, know your child. What we, what, these are the competencies that we're asking for. We want parents to be able to take action. We want them to be able to access. That is to take advantage of some things. We want them to be able to interpret and respond. We want them to deal with those three things in an academic profile and family profile. Those are important because that helps parents to determine how well their kids are doing and then where are the academic deficiencies. The family profile does something that teachers are going to love. It helps parents to make decisions about what things in their family is contributing to academic success and what things are not, and then how to make adjustments. This first workshop. Locate, organize. We need to locate, organize community resources like people talked about here. Many parents just don't know they have many, many churches, many organizations that are trying to help, but, but their problem, many organizations, they can't get those resources and communicate those resources in such a way. Uh, for example, I was at ITT TAC in Chicago at a banquet. The, the president sat next to me and said, Dr. James, we have enough money to fund every black kid, Latino kid in this room, but we can't figure out how to explain it to them. That's how to interface. Company, organizations have to know how to culturally interface with um, communities. This is also part of the 3K curriculum for organizations. That's what. So know your school is understanding these things. It's the same type of companies, except at the bottom we add analyzing advocacy. Um, so the school profile, what is unique about the school? What are the trajectories that you can expect if your kid goes to the school? What are the struggles of the school? What is the staffing like in the school? It's the principal turnover for the last five years. If a parent understands what's going on in the school, they're better prepared to take action. For example, we're in Indianapolis the other day, parents sitting in the high school, Tell them, you know, we're talking, I'm helping them, trying to set them up. I was really bad at this. But they were nostalgic about how they loved the high school when they went through it and how great it was. And as they stopped talking for about 30 minutes, I, I said, do you realize now that when you walk through the halls of your school, four out of five of the kids in your school are failing every subject. And 70% won't graduate. They gave me that face. Like, what? But they left with a community action plan that day. They came in not even knowing as a problem, left out knowing that they have to take action with three defined steps I gave. They also need to understand how to analyze 
the cultural responsiveness of a school and of a curriculum. They can do this. If, if a, trust me, if a curriculum is not culturally responsive, if a teacher is not culturally responsive, it, education is primarily a human process. If culture helps humans to connect to other humans, it is the bridge between difference. When teachers don't know how to build that bridge as they communicate content, this is what a disconnect is happening. But what we want to do is teach parents how to do this at home, because they can help with the process. If they find out that there's a practice, let me give you a simple example. Some teachers teach kids to read with the magic thing. Why do they do this? You know, some kids' eyes just jump all over the place, right? They get used to, they want to focus on each text, the beginning of the letter, the beginning of the word, the end of the word. But it also gives teachers a clue about who's doing what, right? My son, special kid, yes he is, Michael James, he would not read with his finger. He wanted to read with his magic eyes. Teacher, your son's not engaged to read. Well, how do you know that? Well, he's reading with his eyes. <laughs> no, 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 this is a true story. And what dawned on me was there's a cultural disconnect. Now, culture has very little to do with race, by the way. So that's workshop number two, culture is not race. What culture is is shared values. The problem is we taught Micah to read with his eyes at home. When he reads with us at home, we don't use the magic finger. So the simple adjustment that I made was to use your magic finger. That's cultural responsiveness. If parents don't know to look out for subtle things like that, a teacher is saying the kid is disengaged. When in fact, the kid is simply doing what his parents taught him to do. And there's host, there's a number of examples like that, that, um, that know your school curriculum will help parents engage and talk to teachers um, to kind of resolve those issues. Know your community, this is, this is really where, where you start getting serious, where the school and the community and parents have to come together, right? Because the goal here is to use parents as a bridge to connect with community organizations and get those organizations in their resources, in their people power, into schools. You need a mentoring program. This is where you're trained on how to get it. You need tutoring programs. This is what parents are trained on how to do it. You need college readiness. This is what parents are trained on how to do college readiness programs in conjunction with other parents, in conjunction with peers, which you cannot leave out, in conjunction with community organizations, and in conjunction with the school. Like I said, we're all responsible. The 3K curriculum is so designed that each of us has to bear responsibility in, in solving the problem. Now, the educator's part of this is actually fairly simple. I explained to you the markers of social justice. Social awareness, moral courage, um, effective practice. The process where this happens is a little bit different for parents in that we come in and we help teachers create learning communities. So imagine um, us getting a critical mass of teachers in a school, right? We help those teachers to become culturally competent. Why do you help the teachers become culturally competent? Because more than likely the peers will listen to them. They see the daily practices happening in their school. They're more likely to be able to change it than bringing in a consultant who does a three-hour workshop and are gone until next year until your diversity requirement is up again. Humans learn behavior from other humans. We have ignored this in the education progress, in the education process. So we developed this whole idea of communities of practices where teachers come in and they help solve their own problems. No consultant, no matter how good they are, can fix a school. It has to be fixed by the professionals in that school in concert with the community, in concert with parents. This process helps to do that. Thank you, Dr. James. I know that you guys have been sitting for quite some time. So before I sum this up, 
everybody just shake it a little and think about what you just heard. <laughs> we really want to thank you for your participation so far, and, and we're wrapping this up basically at this point. Really, the bottom line is, and you've heard it, you've articulated it yourselves today in the exercises you went through when you looked at what were the conditions, what were the causes, what were the consequences. Um, Dr. James has outlined how the curriculum is designed to empower parents. The bottom line is what this program is designed to do, what makes it unique, is that it is designed intentionally to boost student achievement and close the achievement gap. It is designed intentionally to allow parents to access the tools that are critical for them in doing what they do best, which is parent. We want our parents to parent, we want our teachers to teach. Uh, we say that we're professionalizing parent, parent engagement for the simple reason that uh, for too long we've had uh, parent institutions that are, you know, you hear the jokes about the PTOs and the fundraisers and that sort of thing. Parents have a very valid voice in this process. However, up until now, we've not really connected what parents do to what we expect schools to do. And so we are bridging that gap and help guiding parents through. So we intend to create lots of opportunities, strategic opportunities, for parents to really have that sustained <coughs> professional development over time. This is not a one time you come in and you do a three hour workshop and you're gone. This, this is designed so that communities are intimately engaged together so that you actually change the culture of community, professional learning communities. What we want, as Dr. James talked about, those early years um, post-slavery, when you had um, community and parents coming together in schools to create a learning community within families and within our communities. So that's what we are about. I'm a Board of Education member. I hear it all the time. We just don't know how to reach those parents. We just don't know how to reach those parents. Well, this is an opportunity for us to build capacity within the schools and with parents so that we can have a partnership. And those parents before who you didn't think were going to come out, now you will see them because they have an understanding of what it means when they hear policymakers say, you need to be engaged. You know, that used to be my pet peeve. Board members would say, well, parents need to get engaged. And I would say, well, can you define that for them? Because most parents think they are. They provide food, clothing, shelter, they talk to their kids, they lecture them. I lecture them a lot. So they're engaged. But how does that engagement translate to student achievement? That's what the 3K curriculum is about, getting parents to make those connections. And so those family, school family partnerships would be much, much stronger and more effective and we can solve these crises, we can solve this problem, we can close this issue with gap. And that's pretty much it in a nutshell. What we're going to ask you to do is to take some time to think about that, think about what you've heard. You've got, um, we have a, just a few minutes for uh, if anyone has any lingering questions, and then we're going to hear from, um, we're going to hear from some of our partners who've been working with us on this project. Any questions? Oh, two questions back here. 